I'm Fonzo. And I'm Aliza. And we're the co-host of Grown, a podcast from the moth that shows we're never fully grown. Growing up feels like a phase that should end at some point, but does it ever really? Whether you're 16 or 26 or 86, you're going to have to deal with family drama, your body, and the type of person you want to be. So why not put it all out in the open and go through it together? Join us every other week to deal with cringe, culture, and the courageous efforts of people like you to get grown. Start listening today. Follow Grown on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. On December 15th, 2006, I became an adult in the eyes of the law. While I technically had some new rights, the ability to vote, buy cigarettes, and all that, practically it was still many years before I was adulting independently. The chasm was only magnified by the chaos that was my 18th birthday. My then high school boyfriend got suspended for doing something really dumb, and I spent the evening crying my eyes out about it over a mediocre plate of sushi. The big stressors for me at that time were privileged ones, deciding where I was going to college and how to navigate moving away from my tight-knit group of friends who had become my emotional backbone. Emerging slowly into adulthood felt hard, and I had a really solid safety net, parents who supported me financially, and the emotional bandwidth to navigate it all. So what's it like for the young people in this country who have to learn the ropes of adulthood on their own? This is Embodied. I'm Anita Rao. I was very eager to turn 18 and be on my own. I mean, I was one of those people who really, really wanted to do things on my own. And I thought that I could do things on my own, but that really turned out not to be the case. Meet Stephanie Smith, a former foster care youth and mental health professional. Stephanie first entered foster care when she was eight. And by the time she got her high school diploma, she'd lived with multiple families and attended 14 different schools. Stephanie was still in the system when she legally became an adult, making her like tens of thousands of other young people who age out of foster care each year. Turning 18 was definitely a pivotal point. Uh, It was something that I really looked forward to. I mean, I was very anxious to turn 18 because that, to me, meant freedom. So I think aging out might mean that to a lot of foster children, um, And yeah, it's basically just a step into adulthood, but it's also a very scary time because yes, you, you know, you are on your own now. So what kind of relationships did you have at that period of your life that you leaned on or looked for to support you during that process? When I turned 18, um, you know, I was still really wanting to mend things with my biological family. So I had an older sister that I went and lived with and relied on, but It didn't really pan out very well because, you know, she was kind of struggling with her own issues and she was also a young mother. So I didn't really have a huge support system. I think I really had to learn how to establish a support system and what that looked like and what that felt like. And it really took me a long time to understand how to hold on to relationships and maintain them because For most of my life, you know, all of my relationships had gotten destroyed, basically. So I really had to work on, I guess, just learning what it felt like to maintain a relationship and making a priority out of relationships with people and, you know, gaining the support through through having that. You know, it wasn't just about having someone there to fall back on financially. But just someone there that I could talk to if I was having a bad day or, you know, something was going on, you know, it was like, where could I turn to for like emotional support? So I just really had to like, you know, work from very, very small baby steps to establish these kind of relationships.
Even before foster care, I had a lot of high mobility just moving from place to place. I was in over 20 different um, schools by the time I was a sophomore in high school. And that's also when I was placed into foster care. So it was hard for me to see that this relationship or any relationship would be long term. In my experience as well, my my mom, my dad, they weren't long term relationships, which are your parents. That's Angela Quijada Banks. She's originally from Anaheim, California. She and her four siblings grew up in poverty and experienced homelessness and neglect. At age 16, Angela was placed into foster care. Like Stephanie, she also was still in the system when she turned 18. But the process of aging out for her looked a bit different. I really wanted to take advantage of as much resources as as possible because I knew that I didn't have a super strong uh, family support, biological family support. However, I hadn't had the best um, of luck in the foster care system. So I was teeter-tottering between, do I want to continue to be in a systemized kind of environment or try to go back with my family? But I ultimately decided that um, it might be better for me to go um, the other route and sign myself back in. The systemized support she's talking about is called Extended Foster Care. It's a program offered in most states that provides financial, logistical, and life skill support until you're 21 if you meet certain criteria. It's pretty underutilized, but linked to some positive outcomes for former foster youth, like lower rates of homelessness and better education and employment opportunities. Unfortunately for Angela, the experience wasn't very positive. It ended up not being such a great situation. I was kicked out of foster care. Mm. Um, I was given a seven-day notice, and um, that's not uncommon. A lot of youth experience that. Sometimes it's not a seven-day, though. It's like one day or 30 minutes or immediate. So at that point, I had to figure out um, another place to live with very little support. I ended up reaching out to my dad, ironically, the person that I was removed from. Mm. And he helped me kind of navigate things, although he was going through his own mental health challenges and other things. So I found a place on Craigslist. Um, Luckily, I had saved up some of my allowances and I had started this online tutoring business. So I moved into this random, uh, sketchy Craigslist thing and I didn't hear back from the system until like a month later, and it was essentially just to get information to close my case, but not to actually see if I was okay or connect me with anything. So, yeah, that was kind of my experience. That sounds really disorienting, trying to figure out all of that on your own, kind of at the last second, not really knowing um, how you're going to plan for your future. Did you have, you mentioned reaching out to your dad, did you have friends or like a sense of community at that point? Or um, what did that look like for you? Any kind of extended support network? Yeah. So I um, was in school. I was at NCCU. Shout out to NCCU. And um, I was connected with some counselors and stuff. So I reached out to them and also tried to talk to them about the situation. Um, They kind of gave me a day rate for, you know, emergency things or shelters, um, which was helpful but that wasn't like what I was trying to do and I couldn't necessarily afford it um, at the time (laughs) because it was so immediate Um, but I did not have like my garden litem I didn't have a social worker at the time which I think that's also why it was so abrupt Um, my social worker had she had retired actually a couple of weeks prior Um, and then I had my guardian litem was removed from my case like a year, um, prior because she was trying to help me basically. And I was in between placements and my social worker had okayed, uh, for me to spend the night at an airport for a weekend and my guardian litem disagreed. So that became grounds for her to be removed from my case. There are so many cracks in the foster care system. And statistically, the outcomes for most young folks who age out are not great. 
Aside from all of the very real logistical needs many 18-year-olds have, like how to apply for financial aid, get a car loan, or make pasta sauce, there are also all the intangibles that come from having a reliable, supportive adult in your life, like easy access to advice on dating and relationships. My whole approach was definitely do the complete opposite of what you've seen around you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever is going on, do the complete opposite because that is not giving the results. You know, domestic violence and, um, you know, just misery really is what I saw all around me, not just with my parents, but just other relationships around me was like, no, this is not the type of relationship that I want. I want a loving relationship. I want a healthy relationship. And that's, I think, what was really difficult was, okay, do the opposite, but that only goes so far. You know, how do I have a healthy relationship? What does that look like? Who can I model this from? Um, and also recognizing that although I had really great intentions with myself to try to do the best that I could, that I was greatly affected by this. I mean, you know, a lot of the people that I surrounded myself with um, involuntarily, majority of the time, and voluntarily, um, were not giving the results that I said that I wanted. Mm. Um, and so I had to really recognize within myself the relationship that I had with myself, which I recognized wasn't as healthy. And so um, starting out with a romantic relationships, they were very, um, they were very confusing. And I would say. For me, I put up very big walls. I definitely didn't really give my true self. I think I showed a self that I thought would be liked, that I thought that, that would be accepted, and that I thought would be loved, because that's what I had learned to do. And so not only in my romantic relationships, but definitely I think in the majority of my relationships, I almost created a persona um, to survive, to feel accepted, to feel like, you know, this person cared about me and it automatically, of course, will backfire because if you're not really your true self, which I didn't really understand who that was or what that meant um, because I was stuck in survival mode, you know, I didn't understand what, what I needed to do. How could I connect with myself really fully, purposefully um, and create those relationships to feel genuine love and so um that's kind of how it started it wasn't it wasn't beautiful at all you mm -hmm. know I got myself into a lot of not so great situations and I learned that's the key point is that I learned like you know what this isn't working out and this isn't giving me the results that I thought it would so I'm gonna have to you know talk to some people that are having really great relationships and learn from them and you know grow and Throw, completely throw away that idea that apparently I've married to that I have to be this certain type of person to be loved and cared and you, cared for and, for and to establish some intimacy um, between other human beings. Daphne, how about you dating um, after leaving and after aging out of the system? What did that look like for you? Yeah, I definitely agree with what she was saying. I think I struggled a lot because I really didn't have a good relationship with myself. I didn't really have, you know, a lot of self-esteem and I beat myself up a lot um, about how I grew up. I think I was really just kind of a broken person for a long time. And I think I really had to take, you know, quite a long time. You know, this was a few years we're talking I had to take to really establish a good healthy relationship and a good healthy outlook on myself because I feel like I was completely stripped away of that growing up and I didn't have a good outlook on myself so I didn't have the best relationships and that definitely reflected it was a reflection of how I felt about myself. How did you start to do that kind of inner work like was there a turning point for you where you realized like it's not sustainable for me to keep being in relationships this way this isn't going to lead to something positive yes i mean after you know even with friendships or romantic relationships you know they weren't turning out how i wanted them to and it was just failure after failure i was like something is not right with me something is not okay and i really had to take time to figure it out do the work do the healing on myself and from there I was able to establish good relationships after that had happened. 
Anhila, I'm curious for you. I mean, I I think you mentioned kind of looking at various models in your life of how people cared for each other and and were in in relationships. Did you have models for kind of what you wanted a, a healthy relationship to to look like? Anyone that you were modeling after? Uh, no, because I didn't know really anyone that in an intimate way, you know, like living with them, seeing in and ins and out, seeing like when you're not, when a couple isn't out and, you know, trying to do all the cute things, like how to have effective arguments, you know, like mm. disagreement is perfectly fine, like in a relationship. Um, also understanding that like all the cute Disney movies that I saw is really great and it's can be possible, you know, but um, majority of the time we're dealing with humans. Like I'm a human, like my partner is a human. I'm married now. Um, And so my really big turning point was um, having a relationship. And, um, you know, I thought what I wanted for myself was a man that was a provider that, you know, would help me take care of things and, was more masculine. That's, that has been my more um, gravitation too. And so what happened though, was because of my own trauma and because of what I've went through in my experiences, I've always been the one that, you know, had to take care of everything, make sure, and I'm the oldest of five siblings. So taking care of them, making sure that they're okay. I always was the one that was the provider and not necessarily the nurturer. And, and so really, the struggle there ended up being that I took on being the provider and the caretaker and all of the things, the masculine and the feminine, you know? And so (laughs) I was, (laughs) so in those relationships, I almost disempowered my partner and confused my partner because, you know, I wasn't communicating what those expectations are. This is a partnership. However, these are specific things that, you know, I need support with. Um, and this is how I would love, I need to be loved. This is, you know, knowing those things for myself, you know, there's beauty in, in relaxing and allowing someone else to step up and, you know, communicating that and having those expectations and also, uh, troubleshooting, you know, what happens if this doesn't work out? What is our plan? Totally. And I guess also acknowledging the triggers, like what might come up for you that triggers, um, a, a past experience or a past memory. Stephanie, you are, also married now. I'm curious about the approach of, I guess, committing to a full-time partner. Have there been any moments of your experience in foster care that have been triggering that you all have had to work through in your marriage? Oh, absolutely. Um, And one of the things that I love about being married and making this commitment is that I, I feel like I've finally reached that point in my life where I can be committed to a person and to a family. Um, You know, when I was growing up, I rejected being adopted. I didn't want permanence. And so I feel like I finally have graduated into a stage in my life where I can accept permanence. And I think before I got married, you know, when we were engaged and everything, I did kind of fight it a little bit. You know, there was that voice in my head that, that was saying like, basically run, you know, run for the hills because permanence, I think, is something that's so unfamiliar to people who grew up kind of like how we grew up in foster care. And so I think that was definitely my biggest challenge was being able to accept, you know, family and this is going to be my life for the rest of my life, which it's also a very good thing. You know, it's turned out to be like the best part of my life. So I'm really glad that I did it and I feel like more of a complete person now. I don't feel like this broken orphan child. I just feel like a normal, healthy, stable adult. I know that you um, have a young stepdaughter. As you mentor and and kind of parent her, are there things you notice about your, your foster care experience that are shaping the kind of relationship that you're trying to build with her? I think more than anything, I just want to be, I want to be there for her. I want her to know that I'm here. I'm not in and out of her life. You know, I've, since my husband and I started dating, I mean, I was there from day one. Um, And I just want her to know, you know, I want it to be ingrained in her that she is loved and I want to build up her self-esteem. I don't ever want to tear her down. And like I said, I basically just, I don't want to be in and out of her life. And I think that her and I have such a strong bond because I have been here. You know, I'm, I'm very consistent with her and 
I just, I know that for myself, I would never ever be the person who ended up having my child end up in foster care. Like I would be the extreme opposite end. Like I would do anything to make sure my child feels loved and has the structure and support that they need. Stephanie and Angela are just years removed from their time in foster care, but they're already drawing connections between their own experiences and the ways they want to nurture differently. That deep introspection is something Jessica Lloyd Rogers can relate to, especially because she's seen the system from both sides, as a kid and as a parent. Jessica aged out of foster care many decades ago and went right into serving in the military. Today, she's in her mid-60s and has parented her own daughter and many young people she's fostered. It was such deja vu listening to those two young ladies. When I was in, it was three hots in a cot. and uh, Three hot meals in a bed, basically. Three hot meals in a bed, which is what they give prisoners. Mm. And there was no support. And I aged out and I took the only... Well, I mean, there were other choices, I suppose, but I I chose the military because it seemed the most secure and I would get the GI Bill. So I was planning ahead even then. Uh, But there were no supports when you aged out. That was it. And if it hadn't been the military or an early marriage, I would have been out there with no supports. And too many young people even today are finding themselves in that position, although It is getting a little bit better, and at least people are very aware of that. So I am happy about that change. So uh, you do have a daughter. Tell me a bit about uh, how your experiences in foster care shaped the way that you wanted to be a parent. Lots of ways. One, I never wanted her to feel unsafe. I wanted her to be able to come to me to talk to me about the scariest thing she could think of and know that we would figure it out together and that while I might be disappointed, it was not going to break the relationship and she wasn't going to be beaten or punished or harmed uh, as a result of whatever she told me. That was really important to me. Um, I did not, because punishment was such a big part of my early life, I didn't believe in punishment. Uh, and so I basically raised her with consequences and I would explain, OK, if you do this, these are the consequences. But it wasn't punishment. Um, The other thing that was very important to me, uh, I had so many reasons to be angry, both in and out of foster care, so many reasons. And I was never allowed to be angry. As a foster child, I was supposed to be grateful, um, never show anger. These good, fine people are doing this for you. And I wanted her to be able to express her anger, but I did not want to be yelled at. And so we I sort of, by guess and by gosh, figured it out. So one of our rules when she was young, because she was as feisty as I was, <laughs> was that if she was angry, she could be angry, but she couldn't yell at me. And so we decided that the bathroom was a safe place. So she could go into the bathroom and she could yell and scream and holler and stomp her feet and whatever else she needed to do. And then when she was ready, she could come out and there weren't going to be consequences of for for doing that. And so at a very young age, occasionally she would say to me, Mom, I'm going to the bathroom right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so she would go handle it. And she has turned into I mean, I know you're supposed to love your kids. Obviously, when you come from our background, you know, that's not necessarily the case. But I really like my daughter. Mm. She is just a fine human being. Well, I mean, you went on to also then become a foster parent. You um, did respite foster care. So I'm curious about, I mean, did you have to have your own version of of finding a place to work through any any moments that were triggering or any things that came up for you as you foster parented and parented? I, well, it's really funny you talk. I laugh and tell this story about triggers because now, you know, people talk about triggers a lot. But I am like those young ladies. Um, I could take care of it myself. Triggers were for weak people. I'm strong. I'm a survivor. I don't have triggers. I don't know what those people are talking about. And so I first started when I fostered the second child that we had, we had a 149 
individuals and 203 intakes in 16 months, ages mm. 4 to 18. So when I say I have a PhD in foster care, I'm serious. <laughs> but the, the I think it was the second child that we had, and I don't even remember what it was, honestly, but he said something, and I swear the top of my head blew off <laughs> because I've done so much work on myself. I was aware enough to go, oh, that's what they mean by triggers. And all of a sudden I got it. And now I don't laugh at triggers anymore. And I warn other foster parents, you may never know what your triggers are until it happens. Mm. So be aware because I think the universe has a way of setting us up with the people in all situations that teach us something. And so when you get people who, who even if they're little people who mirror something that you need to look at, sometimes the way that comes to your attention is by a trigger. <laughs> so, well, so it's very, very real. I mean, and especially for for folks who aged out in that experience that that you also had. I mean, what were some tools for working through those triggers while also caring for the child, not wanting them to feel abandoned by you, but also acknowledging that you're having your own real emotional experience? Right. So walking for me has always been get those endorphins going and walk it out. Uh, that's been one thing. I've been a writer my whole life, so I journal a lot. When it, when something was happening with someone right there in that moment, as long as they were safe, I, I was not above saying to them, I'm having a moment, I'm going to go get a drink of water, which was usually because usually things happened either in the bedrooms or in the living room. So the getting a drink of water that was going to the kitchen, give me just enough time. Water's very calming. But it also let them know that it's okay to be angry. It is not okay to take your anger out on other people. Our, our only rule, we were told that we had to have house rules. And our only rule was be nice to yourself and to other people. Because what we found is a lot of the young people who came into our house were really unkind to themselves. Mm. So we know where they learned that. They either saw it modeled toward them or they felt like they weren't worth anything and they weren't worth self-respect and they weren't worth loving. And so the biggest key, which as it turned out, my husband and I pretty much did instinctively was just listening, just being open, setting structure like one of our practices was you had to sit at the table three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if you weren't in school. And they would sometimes, well, I don't like to eat. Well, some of them had never sat at a kitchen table to eat before. Hmm. And so they they wouldn't know what to do. And we also played a lot of skip bow. Now it didn't have to be, which is a card game. Didn't have to be that, but we found that was, it's easy enough that even the youngest could do it. It's a little bit kind of an uno sort of game and older kids liked it and what that allowed was allowed us to listen without being face to face and so we would be side by side playing a game and then they would start talking sometimes about really heartbreaking things um, but it would come out and of course once it comes out which is something that takes some of us a little while to learn once you bring it out it can be dealt with it's when it's kept inside that it festers so you, you've had experience with so many different kids, with different personalities, with different backgrounds. I'm wondering if you feel like there are any misconceptions that foster parents have about what foster kids need that you've learned from, from all of these experiences. Um, you know, yes. a, a warm meal and a <laughs> loving home is, is not, That's it a, doesn't quite go far enough, right? No, it doesn't. And, and you I'm going to be really careful not to hop on my soapbox here, but there is a misconception that all a child needs is love and structure. What many foster parents are not aware of is how wounded these young people are, whether they know they're wounded, they are wounded. Just the act of removal is a wounding. But for many of these young people, I mean, I, I'm just thinking of a couple of specific individuals by the age of six, they have seen and experienced more violence and sexual abuse than people of 60 can even imagine. And so when a child comes in, you cannot make assumptions about their past. 
because they may never have told anyone the full truth about their past. I'll give you a, a non-sexual simple example from my time in care. I was 17, I was washing the dishes and I broke a very expensive wine glass. It slipped out of my hands. It was honestly an accident. And it had been a wedding gift to my foster parents. This was my third foster home. Not the worst by any means, actually probably the best, but still had moments. And I just stood there. I was frozen, absolutely frozen. And of course, she, the, the wife, was so upset. And I understand that. I mean, I would be upset if my wedding wine glass was broken too. It was such a big deal. They actually called the caseworker. And when the caseworker came and we had this little sit down meeting, the caseworker said, well, what is really the problem besides we have a broken glass? And my foster mother said, she didn't even say she was sorry. Well, in my family, my biological family, if you did something wrong and you said you were sorry, your punishment was doubled because the assumption was you were trying to get out of being punished. Mm. Now, nobody knew that. They had no way of knowing, but she made all these assumptions about what a terrible person I was because I didn't even say sorry. And it's a simple instance of how you cannot make assumptions about what their experience has been. Jessica is an advocate both inside the home and out. She's currently serving as the chair of the National Foster Parent Association's Council of State Affiliates, and she has some policy suggestions. One of my fellow advocates says, let's age out the term aging out. Mm. And, and at first I kind of bristled at that. But what she means is that no young person should age out without a satellite, a constellation of adult supporters, former foster parents, coaches, neighbors, uh, family members, bio family, relative family, kith and kin family, they should have those people that they've collected, even while in care, those continued relationships that they can reach out to and say, hey, I'm trying to buy a car. I don't know what to do. So maybe somebody can help them with that. Or, you know, I'm dating this guy and I'm not sure how I feel. And, you know, or I'm coming out and I'm not sure what to do. Um, you know, all of those questions, how to write a check. The first check I ever wrote, I didn't sign. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me. I had to learn it by doing it wrong. Um, so really simple things that as an adult, we may think everybody, well, everybody knows how to rent a, an apartment. No, they don't. When we have a child in our care, we're not just taking care of that nine-year-old or 10-year-old or whatever. We're taking care of the 29-year-old and mm. the 39-year-old and the 69-year-old. You know, I'm 64 and I'm really proud to say that because I didn't think I'd make it past 15. Mm. And so every day is a gift. And I want to use the rest of my time to changing the world. I think it's the least I can do for the people who come behind me. Embodied is a production of North Carolina Public Radio WUNC, a listener-supported station. If you want to lend your support to this podcast and WUNC's other shows on demand, consider a contribution at WUNC.org now. Incredible storytelling like you hear on Embodied is only possible because of listeners like you. And just a quick note, there won't be a new episode of this podcast next week because we're on summer vacation. But we know you probably have a few episodes to catch up on. So go listen to those. Or check out a recent episode of NPR's Code Switch called Playlist for a Summer Road Trip. We were featured in it alongside some other amazing listens, and you should definitely check it out. While we're talking about spreading the love, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it. This episode was produced by Kaya Finlay and Amanda Magnus, who is our editor. Audrey Smith also produces for our show. Jenny Lawson is our sound engineer. And Quilla wrote our theme music. Until next time, I'm Anita Rao, taking on the taboo with you. <laughs>